here in a few seconds. Looks like we're uh, holding steady with participants, so I'll kick us off. Uh, my name is Joe Softley. Uh, I am on the sales and marketing team at Classical Academic Press, uh, and you are not here to hear me talk today. I'll just be serving uh, as our host and facilitator and um, kind of walk us through the webinar today. Um, however, the person that uh, you, you are here to listen to, and I'm delighted that she's here, is Joanne Shinstock. And what Joanne's going to be covering today, um, as you know, if you've registered for this webinar, is writing. Uh, we're talking about writing today, but specifically we're talking about the classical writing method um, and classical academic press's series, Writing and Rhetoric. Uh, if you're familiar with writing and rhetoric, uh, that's outstanding. Uh, we definitely have uh, something for you today as we, as we dive a little deeper into the series and into the pro gymnasmata or the classical writing method. Um, if you're not familiar with writing and rhetoric, or maybe you're not familiar with classical education uh, at all, um, then we probably have even more to offer you today. Uh, from Joanne's point of view, uh, as a veteran writing educator um, and a veteran classical educator. Uh, so there is gonna be a lot to learn today. Uh, we've got about a 30, 35 minute presentation from Joanne, and then we're just going to um, open the door for Q and A. Um, there is a chat box. Uh, I already see people starting to utilize it. You guys are, are probably Zoom pros now after uh, the last three months of your lives and you know right where the chat box is and you know how to use it. Uh, so uh, um, just hello to everyone and uh, great to see people coming from a, a variety of places. Uh, feel free to introduce yourself and let us know uh, where you're from. We've got other team members uh, other than myself who will be um, jumping in and answering some questions in the chat box. Um, if you ask a question and we don't uh, address it directly in the chat box, um, we're gonna put it to the side and, and hopefully address it in front of a larger audience uh, in our Q&A time. If we don't get to your question at all today, don't worry. Um, we're gonna uh, extend an, an email address that you can send your question to. Uh, it's info at classicalsubjects.com, very simple, straightforward. Uh, and you can send us uh, your question or maybe additional questions by that time um, in an email and, and we'll be all over them. We have multiple team members who will be able to respond uh, and help you get on the right track uh, with writing, with writing and rhetoric, um, with your understanding of classical education, uh, whatever, whatever it may be. Um, so without any further ado, uh, it is my pleasure to introduce to you uh, Joanne Shinstock. Uh, Joanne has been an educator for 15 years now uh, she got her master's in humanities from the University of Dallas and is currently, we're very thankful, currently uh, our principal at Scola Academy. Uh, Joanne has been teaching writing and humanities for Scola Academy for quite some time. Scola Academy, for those of you who aren't familiar, is uh, Classical Academic Press's online academy and specializes in uh, restful online learning. And maybe she'll get to touch on that a little bit today too. But we're here primarily to talk about uh, writing and rhetoric and the classical writing method. Uh, so Joanne, you can take it away from here. Thank you, Joe. Welcome everybody. I am so happy to be with you today. Um, I'm gonna share with you really what I have learned um, and offer you the wisdom and the guidance uh, that I received over the past several years teaching the pro gym. So I've been with Scola Academy since 2016. Um, the school started in 2014 with about eight students. We're currently over a thousand enrollments, uh, 25 subjects, 85 courses and growing. We are restful, relational, classical environment. So if you're not um, familiar with the school, I encourage you to, to check it out. Um, let me switch my screen here to bring us into what everyone is here today to talk about. So Wonder, Worship, Wisdom, Work is the title. Um, if you're familiar with Classical U, uh, Dr. Perrin offers um, a great lecture, series of lectures on an introduction to classical education. So I've taken that title from him. He speaks about a way to explain classical Christian education, the design or the model being that of wonder, 
worship, wisdom, and work. So I'm using that format for my presentation today to walk us through some specifics uh, with regards to the program. So to start with, um, I typically begin in prayer with my students. So I'd love to, to pray with you before we get started. There is one God and we are his creation. In joy we pray, eternal glory to you, O Lord. Grant us the gifts of worship and wonder that we may say eternal glory to you, O Lord. You are the source of all life. Grant us reverence for all that lives. You are the beginning and the end of all that is. Grant us the wisdom to live according to your purposes. May we live the worship we offer you in lives of love and praise through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. All right, so we're going to be talking about this fancy term here, progymnismata. Uh, for short, we say progym. This is the ancient writing program that taught students the element of rhetoric. So from the Greeks to the Romans, we arrive at this program that would have been taught to young students in ancient times uh, in, in a grammar school around the age of 10. Um, the progym was the primary method of teaching writing from the ancients through to the Middle Ages and even into modern times. It wasn't obviously until we lost our connection to classical education uh, and now here we are in, in modern times. So most of us probably learned the current traditional method, which is the five paragraph essay so you know you have an introduction, you have three body paragraphs, um, and a conclusion. And this is a good format. Uh, there are good things that we take from this format. Uh, but the argument is that the current traditional method lacks attention to content, to substance. So for the Greeks and the Romans of the classical world, writing served rhetoric, the art of persuasive speech. So when I meet my, my families or my students and they're asking me, how can I tell if this program is working or what does the portrait of a graduate look like if my child goes through this series? And I like to share with them um, these goals. So in a democracy like Athens or in a republic like Rome, rhetoric was the way to enter into public discourse. And I, um, I'm constantly paraphrasing this, this quotation that comes from a rhetorician from Yale, but he said, rhetoric is conceived by Aristotle as the art of giving effectiveness to truth. The true theory of rhetoric is the energizing of knowledge, the bringing of truth to bear upon men. So the writing and rhetoric series teaches children to write well, to think well, to communicate well, and to embrace truth with its effects, beauty, and virtue. So what does that look like um, on a very practical level? Uh, so let's take a look at that. I'm gonna walk through some types of exercises, things that we do in a classroom that also embody scolé, restful learning, um, contemplation, and play. So with each lesson, you typically begin with a narrative, whether it's uh, book one or book 10, uh, whether your child is eight or 13, 14 years old. Um, the structure of each lesson is repeated throughout. So it's, it's very user friendly. And I'm gonna talk more about um, the ease that someone who's inexperienced uh, can use this program. But, so we start with wonder. And so for example, uh, I might show a painting to my students and either prior to looking, the, uh, to looking at this painting, they will read on their own and annotate the lesson narrative. We will read aloud together in class. Parents can read aloud the stories with their children around the kitchen table um, and do different forms of, of annotation to prepare so that when they come to class or meet mom and dad around the kitchen table, their mind is already full of rich material to help them uh, discuss themes and details in the narrative. So 
I will give my students time to reflect. We'll be quiet. Uh, both the, the teacher and the students look at this painting together and the students are guided to think about what do they see, right? So for example, um, describe facial expressions, the placement of figures, other elements that give us a positive impression of Florence Nightingale. So this particular painting was used with my students when we were writing encomiums. Um, so these are speeches or essays of praise. And I wanted the students to be able to think more deeply about the ideas and not just think about it because of it's something that they read, but make a connection to images and photos and paintings and how um, we learn from studying art as well. Uh, this again is a part of this scole, restful learning, contemplation of the better parts. Um, it's drawing on the child's imagination. In the younger levels, instructors can incorporate songs, repetitive rhymes, poetry. So really through contemplation and play, we are cultivating wonder, or ideally, right, we're striving to cultivate wonder in our students, while they are also deepening their understanding of the content that's being presented in the lesson. So once we experience a moment of wonder, we engage in something that I'm referring to as worship. So worship is contemplation of the better parts. Um, it's adoration of the good. Simply put, it's an act of admiring strongly, right? So we're cultivating attentiveness in our students. And one way that we do this is through something like the commonplace exercise. Now, many of you who are familiar with um, the classical tradition, you probably have your own commonplace journal or you encourage this activity with your children or your students in the classroom. So I do the same. And this particular quote was used also with the painting I just shared with you in this unit where the students were learning how to write encomiums and vituperations, essays of praise and essays of um, attack or essays where they're emphasizing what is blameworthy about a particular person. Um, so the exercises in the pro gym are the expressions of the art of writing. In this way, the pro gym is a liturgy in the sense that it is a series of actions, writing being a series of actions that become habits that form the mind. So once a student learns to write in this way, they are on their way to creating a masterpiece all done through the habit of imitation. So commonplacing is capturing famous quotations, lines, phrases. I even tell my children, you know, you hear, um, or my students, you hear somebody say something in church. Um, it's a famous uh, line in a speech, um, a tagline in a commercial. It's just anything that, that we hear that we want to spend more time or that we read and we want to spend more time contemplating it, thinking about it. So we commit it to our commonplace book. The students write down any other thoughts they have about this quotation. Certainly, I ask them to think about how does this quotation relate to the narrative that they read. Um, and so they're strengthening memory, they're deepening their understanding, and it's just another layer of um, how they can come to understand the material so that they can write about it. Everything that we're doing in this process, starting with uh, wonder into worship, is all about deepening their understanding. So they're formulating ideas that go from their mind to conversation to writing. So at this point, we move into this idea of, of wisdom. So the teacher or parents, you lead the child from wonder and curiosity to deeper contemplation of the ideas to prepare them for discussion. This can be discussion in the classroom, discussion you know, on, the, on the couch at home or in, in your homeschool rooms. Um, but pre-writing begins with conversation where students test out their ideas and opinions. They try out thesis statements and evidence. They compare and contrast. They agree and disagree. They learn to argue and not quarrel. Um, 
this is a particular piece that certainly is emphasized throughout the series, uh, virtue cultivation. So uh, in book five, when students are learning the art of um, argument, right? They're, they're learning how to create argumentative essays. We talk about this, what's an argument and what's a quarrel. Because what I encountered with my students that, is that in our modern times and our understanding of certain words, you say argument, kids think that's a fight, right? Or, or a, um, what we would really refer to as a quarrel. And so we teach the children that an argument is a thoughtful opinion that has evidence and that you um, present with reasoning and explanation. So when we look at the whole of this series, we're talking about forming great orators, men and women who will, young men and women who will speak well, write well, communicate well. So it's important that they get this distinction early on between what is an argument and what is a quarrel and our so Socratic discussions our conversations around the dinner table with our parents and our siblings. These are important moments where we can be cultivating this understanding of argument versus quarrel. As adults, I mean, this is kind of the, um, the important role as a teacher, or how I see myself with my students is we also have to embody um, and practice these skills. Ultimately, conversation leads to testing ideas to determine if their essay topic will hold true. So conversation and discussion is an important piece of this pre-writing time. Once we've done exercises that cultivate wonder, um, that give us time to admire strongly the better parts, what is good about what we're studying, and then we've discussed and we've had a chance to try out the ideas that we want to write about, we get to work. So currently at our highest level, year five, book 10, students work to write a thesis essay. The thesis essay incorporates all the skills from every level, training students to take a stand clearly and persuasively. Students at this point learn from Aristotle that rhetorical powers can be used to defend truth and justice Quintilian from first century Roman Empire trained his students to know that, quote, no one can be a true orator unless he is a good person. So throughout the series, students learn to decipher virtue from vice. Of course, this is our extension. You know, we are supporting the parents as primary educators. So uh, virtue formation is important uh, in this training. Students analyze the actions and behaviors of men and women throughout history to discern whether they are praiseworthy or blameworthy. Students look at fables and fairy tales and they go through the same exercise as well. They're learning to take a stand for truth in conversation and writing. So yes, rhetoric can be abused and misused as adults, um, I don't have to go through the examples of how that happens. We can think about our, our current culture and, and see that in different um, places. But for the ancients, this was not a reason to abandon the art of persuasion. Quintilian trained his students to be virtuous and we are doing the same as well through this writing and rhetoric series. So the program is a cumulative experience. Activities build students' memory and bolster the imagination through stories. So I'd like to kind of switch gears for just a, a bit here and as best as I can walk you through perhaps how a child would travel from book one, the specifics that they encounter, skills and knowledge as they move through the series. So Year one, writing and rhetoric level one, covers books one and two. The students gather stories, words, types of sentences to imitate in order to learn to write original stories. Students are building memory and the skill of imitation in order to create clarity and depth later. So there are dictation exercises, there are imitation exercises where they are copying 
the structure of sentences. There's copiousness exercises where they're given a phrase and they have to keep the meaning of that phrase, but rewrite it, let's say six different ways. So they're building vocabulary knowledge and most importantly, they're learning how to say the same thing in multiple ways. Um, so writing in rhetoric one introduces description, amplification, dialogue, written narrations, imitation, discussion and writing, reading, and a variety of narratives. From there, a student can travel into writing and rhetoric two. Level two covers books three and four. They continue to develop fluent reading skills, strengthening the ability for discussion and narration. This leads them to formal outlining and clarity of thought when they're writing. In writing and rhetoric two, we're laying the groundwork for more formal study of rhetoric later on. Uh, with the CREA, they're synthesizing information, they're problem solving, they're making connections between ideas. The CREA takes um, a wise saying, the, the wisdom of perhaps someone great in history, and they're writing an essay praising that. From there, they move into book five, where they're writing an essay praising or attacking a narrative. Um, and then they're moving into book seven, where they are going to praise or attack the actions of a person in history. So you can see um, at each level there that they're building on the basics for um, a solid foundation in persuasive writing. So from there, they move to level three, which is book five and six. They're going to focus on um, developing a deeper understanding of description, amplification, and dialogue, which was emphasized in the first two years and those first four books. In particular, in book five, year three, students are learning the art of argumentation, right? So opinion, support, explanation. They're learning how to present a thoughtful argument, how to attack something thoughtfully, how to defend something thoughtfully. In this case, they're using narratives. Um, so refutation, confirmation, commonplace essay, they are learning the components of the thesis statement, a contrary, they're developing public speaking skills, so we emphasize oration. Uh, we're bringing in modes of persuasion, specifically pathos. And then of course, there's formal outlining and this builds on the previous years of oral and written narration. From there, we move into writing and rhetoric four, books seven and eight. Students are introduced to the research paper the writing and rhetoric series uses the MLA citation and style. Uh, they continue to write persuasively. The emphasis is on transitions, tone, again, the use of pathos with, uh, in their encomium and vituperation. You'll notice in the series that at this point, the rubric starts to change, where initially students are working on content and form, and now you see this piece called style that's been added into the rubric. So, Children are learning to integrate rhetorical devices, figurative language. It's not the first time they've heard it, but in a formal way, this is the first time now that the rubric reflects it so that the students know by using the rubric as a self-assessment tool, they see what is the end picture of the type of essay that they're working towards writing. Um, and I'll talk more about rubrics in just a minute, but. At this point, students are being encouraged to make their own revisions by using the rubric. They, are, um, they can even engage in peer editing, proofreading. And so with uh, the formal outlining that's also emphasized here, students again are uh, reinforcing those foundational skills from the earlier years. From year four, they move into year five, books nine and 10. Nine reinforces description, vivid language, 
um, impersonation, modes of persuasion, figures of reasoning. They're examining the lives of famous people. Um, students receive examples of great speeches and essays from an eclectic group. Uh, my students, we studied uh, Churchill, and these are all within uh, book nine, but Churchill, Jesse Owens, uh, Nellie Bly. So they look at um, statesmen, athletes, journalists, and they're also using oration at this point to support revision. Book 10, when they're writing their thesis, they're learning to read syntopical, um, syntopically to examine ideas and um, create a complex thesis statement. They are producing a well-crafted persuasive essay by putting together the skills and knowledge acquired in the previous levels. From there, we go to book 11 and 12. So these are still in production, but books 11 and 12 emphasize oration, the masters of oratory. So students study great speeches from the ancients to the moderns. They focus on the five canons of rhetoric, the topics of invention. Um, book 12 talks about declamations, declamations being um, kind of the, the manners of branches of rhetoric. But students are at this point prepared to give speeches. So there's a lot here and you might be asking yourself, how can I do this when I did not receive a classical education? Uh, perhaps I am not comfortable with teaching writing. Uh, I just feel inexperienced. Well, the series is flexible. It's easy to implement. There's teacher editions that provide lesson plans, um, suggested lesson plans, activities, suggested schedules for flexibility. Each lesson in the teacher's edition provides you the objectives so you can clearly see what you're going to focus on. Um, there's very little time required to create what you're going to teach um, because you have rubrics, answer keys, teacher notes, clearly marked activities. You can see that the exercises and activities can be differentiated based upon ages and skill levels. Um, I want to take a moment and just pause on that one point and, and share with you a story. So last year I had a um, class that was a, a pretty big mix. We had a high school student all the way down to upper elementary school and we were talking about refutation confirmation. And so in that particular book, we read pretty easy stories, basic stories. One of the stories we were reading is called um, the Micmag story, and it's a, it's a Native American version of Cinderella. So we all know the story of Cinderella. And so the students had to read this story, and they had to decide whether they were going to attack it or praise it. And they had specific lines of defense and specific lines of attack. So they had to decide, am I going to talk about something that's either, you know, believable, probable, possible, or clear, or if I'm attacking it, I'm talking about something that's unclear or improbable or impossible or unbelievable. And so you might ask, how do I do this when you have, let's say, a fifth grader and a 10th grader? And it turned into this wonderful experience where students are reading the story, but then they can take the story and the structure of the um, essay, the requirement, into very different directions. For example, the high school student decided to write a confirmation where she was praising Cinderella for her virtue, for her patience in suffering. So it became this pretty beautiful, well thought out paper. Um, it's a four paragraph essay, so it's not a long paper, but she was talking about the virtue of Cinderella and what we can learn from someone who encounters difficulties, suffers in patience, um, and so she showed me that she understood the content and the form and the structure. And she then shared with the students, because we have our, our, our students read the essays, and I encourage that as, at home as well, that students should be reading their essays out loud uh, through the draft process, but even uh, when they're finished. 
but she could share then with the students her level of understanding and it just opens their world into looking at stories perhaps in ways they hadn't thought about. Now the fifth grader, he also presented a good essay that demonstrated he understood content and form and structure. Now obviously he didn't have that uh, deeper dive into the story, but that's okay. So students with different maturity levels, different understanding, they are still able to approach the same story, the same content, and their um, experience is well worth it. Um, and so again, we talk about rich discussion, creative group activities, fun and imaginative opportunities where they can incorporate creative writing through storytelling. Many of the younger students do this where they'll have um, a paragraph from a story, but they have to embellish it with dialogue. Um, so I know many times creative writing, perhaps you feel gets left out. There's opportunity for that. Um, but we are always providing the students with rich material to think about. So they're never starting with a blank slate. Um, so hopefully that gives you some indication and, and a lot of ideas to think about. But starting with Fable, we cultivate wonder with our students um, to where learning is engaging and challenging. Students typically from grade three through grade nine um, will enter this program. They learn to love writing and they develop skills for more formal study of rhetoric later on. So at this point, I'd love to do questions and I'll stop sharing my screen. Thank you, Joanne. Hopefully everyone can hear me uh, and I'll bounce back in here and, and start moderating Q&A. And we have had a lot of good cues and uh, looking forward to addressing them as, as many of them as possible here in the next half or hour, half hour or so. Um, we, we can extend uh, our time today a little bit past four o'clock um, for anyone that wants to stick around for the extended Q and A, that'd be great. Um, and we'd love it. And you can, and you can continue to, uh, put your questions in the chat box. Um, I've got a lot of them saved here and, uh, we're, we're going to test Joanne out and see how many she can get through, uh, <laughs> the next 35, 40 minutes. Uh, so one of the, one of the biggest uh, and most frequent questions, and there's a lot of way, ways we can a approach this, um, I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of sub questions that would come off, off of this, but uh, placement, Joanne, especially for those entering the series later. Um, we've had a number uh, of educators ask about placement. Uh, if my fifth grader is starting the series, what do I do if my seventh grader uh, starting the series? Um, how about eighth grade? Is it too late to start in eighth grade? Where would I start? So could you just give a review of the different entry points? Um, and I do realize for everyone listening in right now, we may not be able to, um, in the next couple minutes, address your specific placement question. If that is the case, please uh, feel free uh, to send an email to info at classicalsubjects.com uh, with your placement question, uh, and we'll review it for you and, and give you some advice. You can also find um, some helpful information on placement on our FAQ page. Um, on our website, classicalacademicpress.com. I may be able to help you answer your question very quickly. Um, so Joanne, uh, in, in terms of placement, what, what advice do you have, especially for older students? Sure, um, okay, well, when I get this question, I always think um, about a couple factors, but if we're talking about a student that's entering a class setting, I have some advice for that. If it's a home, situation or tutoring situation, then I think we can look up at placement a little differently. So I'll talk first about a class setting or just a, a parent who, who wants to keep the child within kind of their, their target age range at home as well. What I say is that students who are older, who are new to the pro gym, they're not experienced, but they have been considered a good reader. And what I mean by that is that, for instance, we go back to that, um, modern idea of the composition where you have five paragraphs, an introduction, three body paragraphs, and a conclusion. If they can uh, produce that essay with success, so they're demonstrating good grammar, um, good organization of thought, 
good paragraph structure. You see that they understand a topic sentence. Uh, they can provide example with reasoning. Uh, there's, it's an essay that's cohesive, right? If they are able to do that and they are seventh graders, I would put them in year four. If they're older and advanced, you could even consider year five. And I say that because when you, an older student who is a good writer, meaning they understand what an organized essay looks like, they can produce an organized essay, a cohesive paragraph. Book five takes the students through many of those foundational elements that are introduced from book one moving forward. So. Uh, they get into description, they get into the confirmation paragraph, they get into the refutation paragraph. Now, it's not a unit of study, so you might find that an older student who's had success at writing but they're new to the pro gym, they could need some additional time and support as their starting book, um, or it's year five, book nine, um, which is the uh, description impersonation. You might find that they need some support, uh, but they will be walked through those foundational skills. So I hope I didn't confuse that. When, um, when they are a successful writer and they're seventh grade, start year four, which is book seven and eight. If they're advanced, you can consider putting them in year five. So meaning they're eighth graders, ninth graders, and they've had success in writing, you can start them year five, book nine and 10. Now, having said all that, for my homeschooling community, if you have the time and you have the flexibility, I really encourage going back to book one. And the reason why I say that there is this um, great, I think it was a, a podcast or a, a radio interview with, with Paul Cortepeter, and he talked about this very thing. Um, and he said, starting with fable resets learning, it challenges the student um, and they gain confidence by going backwards through really interesting material. And this is what I was saying when I gave that example about the high schooler who wrote the essay on Cinderella. We might think, you know, initially a high school student would not have interest in fairy tales and children's stories or what we think, you know, are children's stories. Although in the classical tradition, we know the fables are, are for everyone and fairy tales are for everyone. But by taking an older student who could be a struggling writer back to the beginning helps to reset that love of learning um, and, and to uh, bolster their interest, right? Like strengthen their in interest in writing. Um, perhaps they had a bad experience in writing. And so they, they think, I, I usually find this myself included as a child, we think we're a bad writer. We're just inexperienced, right? So I like to, to use those terms with my students. It's not about being a good writer, a bad writer. It's about being an experienced writer versus an inexperienced writer. And so um, hopefully that helps um, sometimes a bad uh, or a, a negative stigma that older students can have if we are wanting to start them at level one, right? They think, well, I'm 14 years old, I shouldn't be in level one. Um, so if you have that conversation with them and say, look, this is about becoming an experienced writer. If you're tutoring one-on-one, -on -one, if you're working with your child at home, you have that flexibility. So as you go through the books, once they master that material, move on. You don't have to go through the entire book. It's not about finishing the book. It's about mastering the material. So if you feel that they have mastered those objectives, then move into book two. Uh, look at, and uh, each chapter at the beginning gives you, in the teacher's edition, a box of those lesson objectives. Um, and so you can see right from the beginning, this is what this lesson's going to cover. And so you can decide, you know your child the best. These are the objectives we have to cover. This is where he or she is struggling. Um, go spend the, the time and go through it, but be flexible. So in a class setting, I can understand where you would want to get them in with their peer group. Maybe if even in a home setting, you realize you only have so many years, you wanna make sure you can cover material. Again, go back to those references I made. Um, but if you have the time and you have the flexibility, then consider starting with book one and going from there. Now, if you have an older student who is a struggling writer, but for whatever the reason is, you don't wanna start with book one or they're getting into a class setting, I would look at starting um, year three, book five. 
and my recommendation there is because you are starting off with the argumentative essay, which really is, is the start of that transition in the series from imitation to having to start to build your own ideas. And so students need to learn um, how to present an opinion, how to present evidence, how to give reasoning. And if they miss that as a struggling writer, if they miss that year three, book five, then I see the difference with my students when I get them in year four or year five and they miss that uh, critical piece, learning the argumentative essay. I hope that answers that question. Thanks, Joanne. I, I, I think it's a very comprehensive question. And, and like I said, there's a lot of different angles off of this question. Um, if you feel like uh, Joanne did answer your placement question, outstanding. If not, um, like I mentioned, send us an email or you can reach out to us uh, via direct message on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and we'll have someone address your question there. Uh, another question that we've seen uh, repeated a couple times is um, comparing and, and, and maybe not, not spend too much time on this because I'm, I'm sure that we could, we could go all day on, on comparing our curriculum, writing and rhetoric versus other uh, classical writing curriculums. Um, but a few that, that have been mentioned frequently are Lost Tools of Writing, um, IEW, of course. I, I know there's probably many on here right now who are familiar with IEW and Memoria Press's um, composition curriculum. Uh, so, Joanne, maybe you could say, um, in particular, what sets writing and rhetoric apart um, from other classical writing curriculum? Um, what is the key feature um, that really makes writing and rhetoric stand alone and stand apart from um, some of the others that I've just mentioned? Yeah, that's a great question. From my conversations that I've had with families and parents who have tried these other programs, um, they've been with writing and rhetoric, they've left, they go and they are working on these other programs and then they come back. Um, there is, the comments that I hear are the richness of the program, the delight in the experience of learning how to write that makes a difference with our program. Um, and I'm just thinking, you know, specifically about, for instance, um, some parents are concerned that when they leave another program and they come into this, is it going to be difficult to make that transition? And I will say that, you know, with my students that came from IEW, um, they learned a lot with regards to structure that is essential and it is important and needed. So what I found that was a nice bridge with my students leaving IEW was they had that structure um, and they understood even the richness of language. And so when they came to writing and rhetoric, now we were adding style, right? And we were bringing in that element of um, rhetoric and uh, forms of reasoning and um, modes of, of persuasion. So I've seen my students bridge really well from IEW into writing and rhetoric. Um, the Lost Tools of Writing, I have to say I'm not as familiar with that program, but the, the comments that I've received from parents who have transitioned is just the ease of writing and rhetoric, either because parents are teaching the program at home, so they've enjoyed that. Um, they're able to walk through a lesson with their child. Um, they don't feel like there's a lot of outside prep work as a parent to help them, um, to help their student with that particular lesson. So I hope that answers that question. Yeah, thank you for commenting on that. And um, I, I believe another curriculum that was mentioned was um, Jim Selby's classical composition. Jessica Moore mentioned that. Um, uh, and if there are any uh, additional questions about, we'll, we'll move on from this now, but if there's any additional questions about a specific comparison, um, you can reach out to us and we'll provide um, more details. But I just, I wanted to note that um, we did see that question about Jim Selby's classical composition curriculum, and, and we can answer that and address that question if you reach out to us and, and provide a little bit more detail on that. Um, but I do want to keep moving because uh, we, we have some other really good questions. Uh, the next one I want to touch on um, is navigating this curriculum with two types of students. Um, the first would be a student with a learning disability, particularly dyslexia. 
and um, in what ways would um, a student with a learning disability struggle perhaps with this program? And in what ways does this program enable that type of student to succeed? Uh, and then the second type of student would be um, an ELL student, an English language learner. Um, does this program um, give those types of students a path forward? Um, and maybe what are some difficulties there? Um, so first, uh, students with learning disabilities and then um, English language learners. Uh, could you comment on, on both types of students for us, Joanne? Yeah, I'll, um, I'll talk about the experience I've had with students. I will have to say, I am not a special educator. That's not my field, I'm not trained. I wish we had one of our representatives from our Center for Students for Learning Differences because they probably could speak really well about um, mm -hmm. kind of how we would um, work with students with dyslexia um, or parents can do that as well and um, ELL. But I, I will say, so for example, and I'm just thinking of some of the, the exercises where there's a lot of repetition, uh, the copiousness exercises where students are given examples of sentences and it's not paragraphs. So it's, it's very manageable um, work. So there are sentences that they have to imitate and they're either imitating them for grammar reasons. So for example, they'll be given a sentence and it'll have like a series of adjectives, three adjectives that you need to incorporate in this sentence. So then the student has to write uh, six more examples of a sentence using different language, but must incorporate three or different vocabulary, but must incorporate three adjectives. So I feel like repetition, especially with our language learners, um, that repetition helps reinforce the language. I also think models and breaking it down helps a lot of our students. Um, I worked with a student over this past year and the structure in writing and rhetoric, according to the mom, is what helped this particular child with his learning differences. So the best I can say to that is I do think that the layout of the lesson allows the parent to modify and, uh, and accommodate and allows the teacher to modify and accommodate the student's needs easily. I do think obviously at some point you have to bring in those supports, especially as I said for myself, that's not my field of expertise. So I do have to look to special ed educators to, to be more specific. Um, and many of the parents that come to me, they already have that outside support. So I kind of work with the guidance of the accommodations that the parents give me. Um, but back to the series itself, I think the, the layout and the ease that's already there makes it possible for the parent who knows um, what the child needs as far as that accommodation or modification. And then you can look at the program as it is and make that adjustment easily. That's been my experience as a teacher. Um, so I hope that, that provides some insight. Thank you. And I just, that was a great response. I just dropped in a link for, um, and Joanne, I'm so glad you mentioned this. Um, School Academy, I know there's been a lot of links flying back and forth uh, for those that are trying to keep track. Um, but for those interested in learning more about School Academy's tutoring center, particularly our brand new center for students um, with learning differences, disabilities, you can check out more information uh, via that link that I just dropped in. Um, great resource, brand new. We're really excited about it. Thrilled that it's off the ground, um, particularly from the classical perspective. Uh, moving right along, uh, a question uh, that, that I've seen pop up a couple times is um, kind of structuring the curriculum out during um, the week, right? So one aspect of that is, can I teach this curriculum once a week uh, in a homeschool co-op? Um, and then another aspect of that question is, well, really, how much time a day do we need to dedicate to this? Um, and is there a lot of independent versus dependent work? Um, so yeah, a couple uh, a couple pieces of that particular question, but could you go over um, independency versus dependency when it comes to working through writing and rhetoric lessons? Uh, and then also, perfect, look at that. That is, uh, I'll, I'll hand this one off to you, Joanne. <laughs> Sorry, Joe, I interrupted no, you. No, um, no, you're great. Yeah, that's a great question. And this is what I mean about the series providing examples of scheduling, whether you want to do it two days a week, three days a week, four days a week, five days a week. Um, the book does very specifically go through it. This is from one of the upper level books. 
Um, but you can see here that they even point out specific activities to do if you want to focus on, um, I mean, this is lessons one to six, but the idea here is that the program is very easy to use, whether you are talking about two days a week. Um, in the classroom, I'm with my students two days a week for 60 to 75 minutes. Um, but parents can, of course, meet every day on this if they want. What I will say is, um, and I didn't touch on this, um, but the Writing and Rhetoric series is not a grammar program. We do have exercises within the work that I usually re refer to kind of as, as grammar review. So it is important, especially with our younger students, that they are working on a grammar program while they are studying writing. I encourage um, and, and explain to the parents uh, not to pick a grammar program that's heavy in writing. And then I would just alternate. So do a day for writing and rhetoric, do a day for grammar. Uh, but whatever grammar program you choose, um, ideally it's not heavy writing because clearly you're already getting the writing. Um, now, as far as some type uh, um, types of exercises that can be done independently or that need to be done with a parent or in a group, certainly with our older students, reading the lesson narratives can be done independently. Although I still have to say we all benefit from reading out loud. So I do that with my older students as well, especially when I'm trying to teach them annotation, note taking when they're reading. So I like to model um, how I read and, and how I take notes. I don't do that all the time. So older students do read a lot on their own to come and prepare for discussion. I would say that um, one of the just the most rewarding aspects of this series is that it cultivates good conversation and discussion. I see it in my classroom and then I can only imagine what it does for the family at home. Um, a couple years ago, I was tutoring this student through level two, so books three and four, and that was the feedback I received from the mom, is that she just had such an enriching experience reading the narratives with her son and then talking about it um, before he even went to writing. So you kind of need to decide and, and look at the program and knowing your child or even just thinking about your relationship. Um, what exercises do you want to give time to. I would say because discussion I see as such a critical piece of pre-writing and learning how to write well, they need that conversation to be testing out their ideas and also, you know, receiving input from you. Conversation is, is where I would spend time, especially with the upper elementary in, into middle school years, because you just never know what comes out of conversation when you're, you're talking about some of these um, topics, whether it's um, you know, the, the virtue and the vice of a particular uh, figure in history or, you know, the, the actions of a character in a fable. So conversation's important. Um, we do have a lot of uh, writing drills or, or copious mix exercises. Those I give as independent work. So I would say the things that I do uh, with students together, conversation, um, I do walk through the pre-writing uh, drafting of paragraphs, but there is um, pieces that can easily be done as independent study, reading and annotation, um, the grammar review exercises or copiousness exercises. The book refers to them as writing time. Writing time is a lot of independent work um, that I then go over with them. And, and if I see weaknesses, then of course, then we engage in that. So you can do a lot in two days a week, 60 to 75 minutes. Uh, but you also, with conversation, you can find, I mean, I will devote one entire hour to Socratic discussion, and that's what we do for the day. So um, when you get into the book, you know your child, you see what has to be accomplished and decide, you know, what exercises would be the most rewarding for, for you and your child together and, and approach the, the learning that way. And I think you'll find a rhythm. Thank you. Yeah, I'm glad you touched on Socratic discussion as well, because that conversational element uh, was a question that uh, popped up a couple of times, uh, too, and a very important one, right? It is it is one of the key features um, of this method and what this textbook emphasizes. So thanks for touching on that. 
Um, next one I have for you, Joanne, uh, this is a great one. And another one that we could probably have a whole separate webinar on. Maybe we will one day uh, soon. Um, but can you just outline, you know, why are these classical writing curriculums popping up all over the place now? What's wrong with the modern method of teaching writing? Why are we going back to the classical method? So if you could uh, maybe state one or two of the main differences between the classical writing method and the modern methods of teaching writing um, and why uh, students and educators you know, really do, we insist that they open their eyes to the classical writing method versus the modern method. Um, and then also, uh, if, if you do have, if, if you're a member of a school and you have teachers switching over from teaching the modern writing method to the classical writing method, um, how do they assimilate to the text? How can they be brought up to speed? Uh, and what that process would look like? That's a great question and you're right, absolutely. That could be an entire presentation all on its own, um, a series of presentations, truly. Okay, so when, I'm, when you asked me that question, um, two things came to my mind immediately, ordered thinking and self-control. So why does this program matter? Um, why is the, the um, this ancient writing system important for today? And through experience, this is what I have come to discover. Um, our children, and, and adults included, because I, I put myself in this group, I became a better writer when I encountered the progym, when I had a course to teach this to my students. And mothers and fathers and educators, um, we, we know that experience. We, we become better students when we are our, our teachers as well. But, Writing and rhetoric helps our students to order their thinking, not just for writing, but for conversation. And you don't get that necessarily when we're talking about the modern system uh, of writing. Um, and remember, I, I mentioned that in the beginning of the lecture that the argument was content was missing. So we can look at um, essay topics from modern exams and see essay topics that kind of take us all over the map. Um, some that are valuable, and I think some topics that aren't, aren't valuable, perhaps not even appropriate. Um, but having said that, this, this writing system helps our children to order their thinking, but it also fills their mind with great stories, rich stories in, in imaginative, uh, from imaginative books, but also, you know, expository essays, um, biographies, um, so they're learning, their minds are full of rich content, but the way that they're then taken through these different exercises, learning argumentation, learning how to order their thinking, uh, again, that difference between argument and quarrel, that's not something that's emphasized, I feel, in our modern program, but it is emphasized in writing and rhetoric, the virtue piece. The virtue piece is critical um, as well, because remember, the, the big picture of this program is that we're training orators, um, good people, um, to speak and defend, to speak about the truth and defend the truth. And this system teaches self-control. It teaches discernment. And how does it do that? Well, I give my students the rubric. And I say, this is your tool. This is not just something I use that once you give me something that you've written, I take the rubric, I grade it, and you get this score, or you get this mark, and then you just put it away. By the time a student hands me an essay, they should have already gone through that rubric. So they can tell me, I have in my essay what's in this rubric. Now, the quality is something different, right? The level of mastery, they do need the teacher, um, the parent, to assess that, but they should be able to say, yes, I have an analogy here, or I have um, my example, and I have my explanation, right? All of these pieces, a thesis statement. They can use the rubric in that way, and they should. So by using the rubric as their self-assessment, they're training themselves to make good judgments, and therein is that discernment piece, right? We're, we're taking them from being an inexperienced writer to an experienced writer. And self-control, meaning the patience to walk through the steps, the 
the process, use the rubric, it builds good judgment and discernment. I just don't think you get that type of virtue formation in the modern writing program. It's more about, do you have your five paragraphs, your intro, your body, your conclusion, but the bigger picture, right? It, it's just not there as far as what you're cultivating um, in, in the, the soul of the student, um, in the mind, in the heart of the student. It's just about getting the essay done. Did I do it in, in the right format and structure? And content is, is secondary. So ordered thinking, self-control, um, those are big pieces that come out of that. And, and of course, just, just the delight in reading great stories and then the delight and joy that a child experiences at the end. Now, yes, in the middle of it, they might not be joyful or happy or say, oh, this is so delightful, right? It's hard work. Writing is hard work. And so, of course, therein also is, is a moment for, for teaching virtue. We have to teach our children um, that this is, this is hard work. So um, it's good for the soul. It's good for the mind. It's not always going to feel good, right? But that delight and joy comes at the end when they pr present their masterpiece and they know it because they understand from the rubric um, or the guidance of the teacher um, or because they have been shown examples of mastery work. Now, as far as teachers coming in from um, traditional modern uh, training programs, or um, I shouldn't say traditional, I should say conventional training uh, programs or, or schools, that's where I was. Um, I mean, I, I taught in a school um, for a long time and, you know, a traditional school setting five days a week and um, it was not a classical school. So what I found when I came into uh, learning about the progym, looking at the writing and rhetoric series, I did not find the transition difficult. What I found was that I was working with half truths, right? And writing and rhetoric opened up the full picture of writing. Um, it opened up just a richness that wasn't there before that made me a better teacher and made me understand um, kind of why we're trying to teach our children to write well. That it's, it's not, because sadly, you know, in, in, in conventional schools, writing is for the AP exam, or it's for the college essay, or it's for, I just need to get this English essay done. Um, but this, this bigger picture is not there when we think about it in terms of training our students to be orators. There's a disconnect even on that level between writing and oration. Um, and so I look at writing and rhetoric as the fullness of truth really when we're talking about what makes an experienced writer. Whereas in my previous teaching experience, there were pieces of the pro gym there. We weren't using those terms, um, but we were focusing on description. We were focusing on copiousness. Uh, we were focusing on rhetorical devices, figurative language, um, but I also didn't know how to teach it. And, and that's what I found when I came to the writing and rhetoric that my methods were not the best. Writing and rhetoric um, and certainly classical pedagogy has given me the, the, the methods, the way that makes this possible. So if you're a teacher that's concerned about how do I make that transition, I wouldn't be worried because uh, the, you know, like I just said, that experience that I had, it was taking kind of half truths and then coming into um, the fullness of this experience. And instead of being kind of like jumping from this point, like this cliff to this cliff, now the writing and rhetoric allowed me to put the planks back in the bridge so I could see how, where I began, you know, was kind of um, perhaps the beginnings of really what writing, writing and rhetoric is trying to instill in our teachers and our students. So it's an easy transition. Um, and again, whether you're a classroom teacher or a parent, the layout of the lesson planning, um, the activities and the suggestions, there 
it, it's just so easy to use that you don't have to feel like I have to be a master in classical education to do this or a master in the pro gym. You'll get there. Um, you will get there, but you don't have to be there to first be able to teach your students. You can learn with them. Thank you for that really lovely response, Joanne. And um, there is there is truly not a set amount of time that, that we could give to that one particular topic in question because it is it's ongoing too. It's it's fluid and, and there's a lot of different pieces of it that are so worth covering. Um, so thank you for taking the time to discuss what you did and maybe we will be looking at a longer discussion or a separate webinar at this uh, at some point. Um, we have a few more minutes here. I'll try to get through a few more questions. Um, we had one that I, I think you're perfect. Uh, you're the perfect candidate to address um, because it deals with humanities as well and you have a background as a humanities teacher. But uh, when it comes to folding the writing and rhetoric curriculum into humanities studies, um, could you give us some examples of what that might look like, uh, feel like for educators, um, whether at home or in a homeschool setting or even in the school setting? Yeah, that's a great question. So the program is connected to um, history. And so you'll see that book one focuses on uh, Greek and early Roman times. And as you travel in the series, your students are going to encounter narratives starting with the ancient world. They'll move into the Middle Ages. They'll move into stories about colonial America, the American Revolution, uh, the Federalist period. They'll get into the Civil War. They'll get into um, the Wild West, um, the Gilded Age, the, Depression, the, the Great Depression. And then, of course, um, the books that are uh, the final years of, of, of the program, they're getting into the 20th century. So it is very easy, doable to start to connect the writing units into particular history units that you might have laid out for your family. Um, this also gives families an opportunity, for example, if you have, as many homeschoolers do, you've got multiple ages of children and perhaps you're trying to cover the same time period in history. So the narratives will allow you to do that and then you can differentiate the activity um, or the writing assignment. So everyone reads the same um, story, let's say, but then you might require, you know, your second or your third grader to do a particular um, dictation exercise, right? And then the high schooler might be writing um, an encomium. So, so there's a lot of ways to um, move beyond the text, right? I mean, you can use the text as your guide as a homeschooling parent, knowing that they're connected to these units and, and the, it's full of just rich stories, um, and you can use those, but then you can be creative and kind of pick and choose the activities that you wanna do. So as far as bridging writing and history and literature, it's all there for you. Um, you can do that. Um, don't feel that you're kind of bound to a lesson and what's there. You can certainly be flexible and move out of that. Um, I hope that answers that, that question. Thanks, Joanne. Uh, I'll ask this one as well. Um, and I, I don't believe we covered this earlier, but the process of, of drafting um, and creating drafts, there's not a lot of apparent space in the textbook for that. Um, so how is drafting incorporated and what is the role of drafting when it comes to the writing and rhetoric series in particular? Okay, yeah, that's a great question. I do spend a lot of time with my students um, I call them the pre-writing prompts, but when you're looking at a particular chapter, um, you'll see, and, and this is when the students start writing the essays, whether it's the CREA or the refutation, the encomium, uh, and certainly on into the thesis, but you're given very clear guidelines for what goes in the introduction, what goes into paragraph one, paragraph two. So I do spend a lot of time going through that with my students. So I tell my students we're doing a pre-writing workshop and that's what we do. I walk them through. Um, I want them to share their brainstorming with me. So we'll, we'll do um, notes together. And, and I give them a lot of flexibility for their pre-writing. 
Some students want to write complete sentences, they do that. Some students want to do bullets, um, mind maps, um, trying to think of some of the other, other ways that they do it. Oh, the, the formal outline. So I give them a lot of flexibility when they're doing the pre-writing. And then I have them go home, take their pre-writing and their rubric, and now they have to start putting that information into formal paragraphs. Then they bring that back and they read their essays out loud. That's a part of the, the drafting process. Um, they read their essays to their peers. Um, you can read their essay you know, to, to the parent. And I want them to hear, I mean, that's why that oration is a part of the, the drafting process. Because when we read it out loud, we can hear our mistakes, we can see our mistakes. Um, and so, or, or we can hear that that's not quite the way we wanted to say it, or maybe we're missing uh, some important details or reasoning. So I would say that's the two places where I spend the most time, conversation and then drafting, going through those pre-writing prompts and then having the students um, read out loud their draft and then they go back again and they revise. Um, and then of course they present their final. Um, I hope that answers that question as far as how to approach the drafting. Thank you. And the last question, this one just popped up and I, I think it's a great one to, to close on uh, and maybe give Can us- Can I just pause for one second, Joe? And I, I just saw a mom pop up a question all in a no. week. No. <laughs> so I, I know it sounds like a lot. Um, however, remember, pacing is flexible. There are weeks where I realize we need more time. So we take it. We spend two weeks if we need it, right? Um, do that. So you're not bound to a timetable. Um, and I think I said it early on, it's not about finishing the book, it's about mastery of the objectives, right? Um, I know teachers in a classroom sometimes um, we're, we're bound to certain rules. Um, and timetables, um, all I could say to that is, you know, maybe encourage your administrators to, to rethink that approach. But parents at home, you obviously have all the flexibility. Um, so slow down, uh, make changes as you need to. I just wanted to say that. <laughs> Thank you. I think I could hear Christy's sigh of relief <laughs> through the Zoom call. <laughs> yeah. Great follow-up question, Christy. Thank you for uh, thank you for asking it. And then I'll jump into this question um, from Angel. Angel, thank you for asking this. Uh, creative writing is a term that is thrown around a lot. How would you define creative writing, Joanne? And how do we approach creative writing um, from a classical perspective? Is it frowned upon? Um, and if it isn't, how can we encourage it and establish it? So this is my advice, and I, and I only say this because this is what I've learned from other people. So I think other teachers and, and um, educator, you know, masters in, in this field have, have taught me this. Creative writing is tricky because so many times we'll say to students, well, it's creative writing, just write something. But they don't have anything in their mind, right? Like they don't have the content, they don't have the substance to write. So you need to provide that substance. The student needs to be able to experience good content, right? So reading good stories. Um, those are the examples of great writing that the students learn from. So you'll notice in the series when they're doing what I would say are creative writing activities and, and this is with the younger students. So um, years one and two, probably somewhere, you know, grade three to the start of grade five, um, end of grade four, they are provided excerpts of stories, stories that are already written, right? And the exercises are then, they need to add dialogue. So they look at just a, a paragraph that's full of description and they have to decide, okay, if these characters start to have a conversation, what are they gonna say? So now they add dialogue or it's a paragraph with description, but I want them to add, right, to amplify the paragraph. So they're going to add description. So they're storytelling and they're writing and it's creative, right? They're adding their original ideas to it, but they're given something to start with. They're not just told go write a story or go write a poem. 
they can do that later and they should, but they first need to be given structure and an idea of what a story looks like or what good dialogue is or what good description is. So that's what I would say in the classical tradition when we talk about creative writing. They have to understand structure, they have to understand form, they need good content. Um, so show them you know, what good dialogue looks like. Show them what a good descriptive paragraph looks like. Um, one year I did this with my students where I just asked them, if you're reading a book and you just love the paragraph because it has you know, engaging dialogue or vivid imagery, bring it to class and let's read it, let's hear it out loud. So it's those types of moments that are, I think, preparing and training the child to be potentially a great writer of imaginative you know, pieces. So that's the advice that was given to me. That's what I've done with my students. And I have found that it works. I see it in the writing and rhetoric series with the little ones. Um, we do it as well, even in, in year five, when we're talking about description, they read examples of descriptions. One in particular, um, the soldier was retelling uh, the Christmas story, right? I, I think all of us are familiar with it, but in World War I, when Supposedly they stopped fighting and then they celebrated Christmas. So there was a soldier who retold the story. <clears throat> and I gave that story to the children. They had to read it. And then they had to imitate the style of this writer and retell a favorite memory of theirs. So they're telling a story, but they're imitating the style of a particular writer. Then as they grow in confidence of that, they can, and they should, grow in their ability to create original work. But it's only after they've spent time um, practicing and imitating, right? Then they know what they're doing. I mean, it's kind of like you think about a child who's learning piano or um, a child who's learning to build a deck on the house, right? I mean, they have to have a master show them what does the masterpiece sound like if, if we're talking about music? What does it look like and I'm not a builder, so I'm not even going to try to come up with terminology, but <laughs> what does, you know, what are the tools and the skills and, and the math that you need to, to build something well? You have to walk them through that and show them that, and then they can go off and be creative and, and build and make on their own. So that's how I look at creative writing in, in a classical tradition. Thank you very much, Joanne. All right, everyone, uh, I have a few resources to show you quickly for those that have stuck around with us for this whole time um you guys are invested uh and you're excited from what i see in the chat box and and that just thrills and motivates us too uh school a academy and classical academic press um because we feed off of your enthusiasm when it comes to creating this material to improving this material and in terms of our online courses in finding the right teachers and, and creating uh, the right dynamic to help your students succeed. Uh, so thank you, thank you, thank you for the feedback that you've offered and the questions that you've offered today. Um, we truly are the ones who should be thanking you uh, for investing in um, the classical, um, the recovery of classical education and, and for teaming up with this in, in this regard. Um, so like I mentioned resources very quickly, I wanna point out four of them to you. I'll, I'll go through these quickly if you wanna hang in. Um, and explore these more on your own. Um, I actually don't know if I can screen share. Jo Joanne, do you know if you can enable screen sharing for me? Yes. <laughs> you are the host at the moment. Um, if not, I will have to just drop in some links. You should be able to do it. Uh, you've done it, thank you. Sure. All right, I'll screen share here. Okay, so the first thing I wanna point out, um, on our website, Classical Academic Press, um, if you go to resources, um, you'll see FAQs there. We mentioned that before, but product lines, um, you'll see all of our series right here, all the way at the bottom, alphabetical order, writing and rhetoric. Okay, from this uh, hub, you can view any product in the series um, from any of our books. But what I really want to show you is if you go to the product page, um, so here just simply having writing and rhetoric book one, our fable program. Um, see the description. Um, this is support tab is what I want to point out. And there's some great resources on the support tab. 
um, for every book in the series um, that you can access very easily. Um, view the PDFs for rubrics, scope and sequence, suggested schedule. And then also at the top of every page, you'll see a product image. If you click on that image, it'll open up a uh, PDF sampler from the book. Now I just opened it up in Safari to show you all that it takes a lot longer in Safari than Chrome. I completely forgot that it doesn't work as well in Safari. So learn from me. Um, if you're going to open it up and explore our um, sample content from the Ready and Rhetoric books, do it on Chrome or Firefox, not Safari. Uh, second resource I want to show you is on our YouTube channel. This is a great one um, and it often flies under the radar. Um, but if you love uh, learning through videos, uh, head on over to our YouTube channel, Classical Academic Press on YouTube. Um, if you're on our homepage, you can, you can access it via home or playlists. If you go down to writing and rhetoric, um, you will see a full library. I think we have over 50 writing and rhetoric videos, uh, maybe a little bit off that exact number, um, 52, there you go. And, and those videos are from two writing and rhetoric educators, um, one at Oaks Academy uh, in Indianapolis and another at the Geneva School in Florida. And there's also videos from the author himself, Paul Cordepeter. Um, and the videos are, are short and sweet. Most of them are between a minute and three minutes long. And I'll give you a lot of great insight on the series. So the Ready and Rhetoric playlist on YouTube, definitely a resource worth checking out. Uh, and then the final resources, um, Joanne did not know I was going to do this, but the Scully Academy blog, uh, there are some, some great uh, blog pieces on here, uh, including uh, Prudence in Writing by Joanne. And then a little further down, you'll see uh, this post by Krista Sethman, uh, giving form to lofty ideas, writing prompts for your students, also worth checking out on the Scully Academy blog. Um, and while we're here on School A Academy, also refer back to our courses. If you go to all courses, um, you can view our writing options for lower school and then for middle school um, as well, up to writing and rhetoric year five. And finally, last but not least, um, Classical Insights back at classicalacademicpress.com. Um, I won't go digging for specific blogs right now, but there are um, additional blogs and podcasts um, on insights about writing and rhetoric and about the classical writing method if you want to do some more digging. Another great place um, to find some treasure on classical writing. Uh, so that is my last piece for everyone. Uh, we've gone past an hour and 20 minutes. This has been definitely one of our longer webinars. Uh, so thank you to everyone that uh, hopped on board with us. Uh, Ashley, great question. I just saw it just popped, just popped up. No um, Classical U courses at the moment, to my knowledge, specifically. Oh, we do. We do have one course on Classical U by Andrew Pudua um, that pertains to the Classical Writing Method. Glad I remembered that. So there is, there is one Classical U course. Um, Joanne, thank you for teaming up with me today and taking the lead uh, and sharing from your heart on Classical Writing um, and Writing and Rhetoric. Uh, to everyone uh, who has been a part of this meeting, thanks for stopping by. Stay tuned. Uh, we'll be doing webinars throughout the summer. Um, in two weeks, we're having one on Latin Alive. That'll be our next one. And then after that, it'll be on Logic and Rhetoric um, as part of our um, Subject Spotlight series this summer. Uh, hope everyone has a great weekend and a great afternoon. Thanks for tuning in with us today. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone.